Hello, everyone. I am Aishan Hutchinson, the director of the Creative Writing Program here at Cornell. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first event in the spring 2021 Barbara and David Zalaznik reading series together. After tonight's reading, there will be six more in the spring series. I hope you will join us again for those. Um, to stay informed about our events, uh, please visit our website. And while there, please sign up to be added to our email list. This series is made possible thanks to the generosity of our donors, Barbara and David Zalaznik, to whom we extend our bountiful thanks. This spring series is dedicated to the memory of the great novelist, Alison Lurie, who died in Ithaca on Thursday, December 3, at the age of 94. She taught in the creative writing program from 1969 to 2005. She was brilliant and suffered no fools, whether in fiction or in life, and bore what Professor Alice Fulton called a smart, kind, sharp, and canny presence, a presence that will endure certainly for a long time to come. Speaking of brilliant and suffering no fools, our two feature readers, poet Valjina Mart and writer Nafisa Thompson Spires, embody and surpass those in astonishing ways. We're deeply fortunate to have them with us for this evening's Richard Cleveland Memorial Reading. The Richard Cleveland Memorial Reading was created in 2002 by the family and friends of Richard Cleveland, Cornell class of 74, to honor his memory. He was a poet, editor, and naturalist who spent many of his formidable years in Ithaca. Our readers will be introduced by my colleague, J. Robert Lennon. After their reading, Professor Lennon will moderate what will definitely be an illuminating and fun conversation with Martin Thompson Spires. You can participate in the conversation by submitting questions in the chat throughout the event. A final reminder that this event is being recorded. The recording will be available to view at the same URL um, sometime after the event. Now, over to you, John. Thanks, Ocean. I am uh, delighted and honored to get to introduce my colleagues, Valgina and Nafisa. And the first reading will be from Valgina. So I will introduce her first. And I look forward to uh, reading your questions, and I will ask the writers of them after the readings are done. Uh, Valgina Mort is the author of Factory of Tears, Collected Body, and most recently, Music for the Dead and Resurrected, published last year by FSG, and which has been named one of the best poetry books of 2020 by the New York Times and, the, and NPR. A poem from this collection was shortlisted for the Forward Prize. Mort is a recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Lannan Foundation, and the Amy Clampett Foundation. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Best American Poetry, Poetry, Granta, and Poetry Review. Born in Minsk, Belarus, she writes in English and Belarusian. To this, I will add, I think Valjina's new book is simply extraordinary. She begins with the simplest elements of language and matter, moths and snow, roofs and roots, bones, dresses, dogs and hair, and recapitulates and recombines them, braids them into complex instruments of extraordinary haunting power. Do you know what a ghost looks like, she asks in Rose Pandemic, a poem that seems to look backward into history and forward into the future at once and into the present now that I think about it. The punchline is, it looks like blood. Valjina's readings are among the most affecting and spooky and more than funny I've heard, and I'm delighted to get to introduce this one tonight. Valjina, over to you. Thank you so much, John. I would like to start by saying that I measure my time here in Ithaca by the Zelaznik series, living from a reading to a reading. So I would like to thank the Zelaznik family from the bottom of my heart, as I also thank the friends of Richard Cleveland for having chosen to honor and commemorate his life like this with reading series. Um, John and I read in this series together a few years ago, and I, I remember that reading very fondly. Perhaps the circle would um, 
circle back and we'll read together again soon. Um, a couple of years ago, I spent a year in Rome, Italy, and um, upon return, my colleagues at Cornell kept asking me whether I had a good break, um, whether I had a good time, a fun time. So today I'd like to put any rumors that I'm in fact capable of having good time and a good break to rest by reading one very long poem. Uh, this poem is set in Rome and um, also in the forest of Bilaveja, which is an ancient forest in the west of Belarus. Um, you might have heard of the Bilaveja Accord, which was an agreement um, uh, signed to confirm the decision to dissolve the Soviet Union. It was signed, uh, signed at a meeting held in the Bilaveja forest. It's also a home to this animal uh, that comes up in the poem, uh, the Bilaveja bison. In Belarusian, we say zubr. Um, it's the largest and the heaviest land animal in Europe. And you'll hear this word zubr come up in the poem as I read. There's another forest, uh, there's another foreign word uh, in it, uh, and um, my uh, stumble on forest is um, uh, very Freudian because uh, the Ital it's an Italian word, il forestiere, and uh, it does sound like a forest, but it actually means a foreigner, a stranger. My poem addresses Mikola Husowski, a Belarusian writer, though at the time when he lived, uh, there was no Belarus yet, so he was a Litvin writer. He grew up in the Belavieja forest. He was a son of a forester, um, and uh, so his father hunted for Zubr, for this wild bison. But then he started working with a Polish bishop who took him to Vatican, to Rome. And there, Mikola Husovsky became il forestiere, a foreigner, a stranger. Um, so all I will read for you is this long poem. And um, I was promised that um, the text will appear next to me. So um, you could read it as I read to you, uh, it might seem, it kind of might displace you a bit in the beginning. It might seem a little strange and unfamiliar, but I think that, I hope that by the end, well, I know that because I've already published this poem, so I got to be uh, sure of it. By the end of it, um, you will uh, know and understand why this wild, huge beast uh, that lives in the ancient forest on the edge of Europe is so important to me. Music for a girl's voice and a bison. Winter in Rome, poplars straight and stripped like Marcius. The river's dark iris circles blind piazzas. Tosca and Triviata drink sour coffee through an orange slice cut out of their faces. The twins, rescued by a kitchen table, nursed by goose flesh of oranges. Their feet tap on the tiles like choking fish. Their heads ring, a ringing from the stomach, a ringing beast whose upper body is your own, Rida, while whatever's below the waist is my dream. In 1521, while watching a bullfight in the Colosseum, Mikola Husowski remarks that the scene reminds him of a hunt for a wild bison, Zubr, 
biggest of its kind, that lives in the woods of Bilaveja, a primordial forest where Husovsky himself was born to a family of Litvin pagans. Immediately, Pope Leo X orders Husovsky to write down in verse a detailed description of a pagan hunt for the Eastern beast. You run your mouth, Mikola, and bison run, the shape of toothache, the size of foam. What do your arrows catch? Your breath, Mikola, amid cypress trees and temples that crawl upon hills on their spider-leg columns. How could you, Mikola, above the arena where bulls' bath, baleful eyes blind the spectators like camera flashes, remember of all the innumerable beasts, one of our Belarusian woods, Zubr, Ash Wild, veins, arm thick, lungs like two tablets of stone. Zubr looks straight into the Medusa face of what's to come. On earth, where all disease is cured by walking, Zubr walks out of the woods looking to kill his loneliness. A sylvan angel of history, a bison of melancholia, a black van. I was in Rome, better stuck between ribs of a wild bison, better in Moloch's stomach clenched in free fall than between marble veins that pump stone blood inside stone muscles. How could you? Mikola, il forestiere, son of a Litvin forester, now in Rome, amid cypress trees and persimmons, amid poplars straight and stripped like Marcius. Mikola, from our woods that only conifers get to escape, tarred with honey they swim, strange fish to shipyards where rootless, amnesiac, they are built into ships that cross an ocean like a street. Nicola, under the rim of a ship's board, Medea's chewing gum. Our strange fish carrying strange cargo from the woods where people worship sun, genitals, and a red thread sucked into white linen. Mikola, of one truth, one story, one God. Why would a woman with 13 children pray to one God? A pope with the predator's name and habits commissions you to capture, in verse, a beast whose lungs are two gravestones side by side. The left stone, slightly smaller, on top a heart like a forgotten hat, a cap of red melted snow. What's heavier than a bison? A bison's stare. A tree stands decorated with wraths of hunters' guts. A guts, a tangle of girls' hair. A map of our woods, a tangle of girls' hair. Year 1500, Copernicus in Rome observes the eclipse of the sun. Year 1543, later yet independently of Aristarchus, Copernicus describes the sun as the central fire. Bilaveja is frozen. Bilaveja is beat by the storms of hunts. Bilaveja's son is boarded like a closed-down shop. Zubr, central beast, central black, central dream in the icy air. Dirt and ice rise to cheer its hooves, runs, and running smashes his shit to nothing, so that shit never hits soil, so that he won't be tracked. This is us, then, bisons and traceable shit smashed to ashes. Our history is a closed-down shop. Bilaveja 
is shared between Belarus and Poland with a borderline running across the forest. For the sake of clarity, we'll be referring to this borderline as a threshold of pain. Pain proof, yet by any small sound wounded, Zuber digs into the thicket past the skeletons of trees. A crown of guts on a frozen bush. Bison is our black box. A Trojan Zuber packed with murdered poets. A sylvan angel of history. A bison of melancholia. A black van. Bison of decency. Bison of burdock and dill. Bison of small countries. Bison of rape. Bison of having no evidence. Bison of illusions of golden past. A beast with a name for people without a name. Bison of hostages. Bison of early snow. Bison of misspellings. Bison of barley and truce. Bison of Tsessa and Cisium. A beast whose name we could breathe into a tube to check the level of fear in our blood. Bison of mob law. Bison of smashed dishes, bison of drooping mallows behind houses, emptied like stomachs at the dawn of a century. Trojan bison of history, Zubr, forgotten by Adam. Zubr, filed as uncategorized in the depths of woods. A people misspelled, underlined in red, filed as uncategorized in the depths of apartment blocks. November, bison are mating. The woods tremble as if somebody slowly moved across them an invisible fiddle bow of light. November, bison shaped. In Rome, I had a habit of taking books in my language, written by authors no one in the West ever reads, to a swimming pool at a local gym. Aspiring Italian tile, neon blue water, museum-like quiet, and a European almost nude, standing, walking, preparing to jump in a changing room where women rotating like clockwork, dressed and undressed, I would open my book, exposing the alphabet of my language, the inked goose flesh of its unheard of perverted signs. Sweat and chlorine, crunch of snacks and clogged ears, the changing room was a womb. My strange letters, chromosomes, viruses multiplied in the warm, moist air. The radiation of the unknown tongue. Once, on my way to the pool, on a dark, rainy street, I walked into a large pile of leaves, disturbing it with my boot. A maimed Raven walked out, large, heavy-chested, its wing hanging like a black cabbage leaf. You have disturbed me, she said, as she limped, bison-shaped, straight into traffic. To change the direction of thought, break a bird's wing. I broke its wing. To fix a misspelled letter of your name, pluck a bird's eye. I have disturbed you, my bison-shaped heart, at the intersection between vocal cords and war chronicles stands a bleeding zubr. At arm's length, a zubr ringing. At arm's length, Zubr sings with the voices of my dead. I carry my Zubr inside me. Absence of explanation or evidence is my survival trick. 
absence of my blood from your history books is the reason why in the fall fog spreads itself on earth in a silent protest fog is the bison of history wherever i land i upset the balance of borders Something in my blood makes me drop on your ground as a stone drops into a full glass. I arrive and at once borders spill. Reason for your visit? Harry history, sir. Reason for your visit? Book delivery for a starving bison. Reason for your visit? The closing of the shop of history. Occupation, absence from history books. Occupation, naming things a tangle of hair. Do you have any luggage? Yes. What's in your luggage? Ringing. Through a diamond fence, Mikola, dead, offers me a handful of blueberries. It is a dream. He looks so well fed, a home is a womb on a frozen bush. To untangle hair, untangle fog. To untangle fog, release rivers into piazzas. To release rivers, cut bison's throat. Now watch blood rush. But what is blood when blood is a tangle? of hair. Thank you. Thank you, Valjina. That was a terrifying postcard. Wonderful. All right. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second reader, Nafisa. Nafisa Thompson Spires is the author of Heads of the Colored People, which won the Penn Open Book Award, the Hurston Wright Award for Fiction, and the Los Angeles Times' Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction. Her collection was also long listed for the National Book Award, the Penn Robert W. Bingham Award, and several other prizes. She's also the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award. Nafisa earned a doctorate in English from Vanderbilt University and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from the University of Illinois. Her short fiction and essays have appeared in Paris Review Daily, The Root, The White Review, Story Quarterly, and 400 Souls, A Community History of African America 1619 to 2019, among other publications. And work is forthcoming in Plowshares and multiple anthologies. And I think we're going to hear one of those forthcoming works tonight. Heads of the Colored People is not just one of my favorite story collections of the past few years, it's one of my favorites full stop. Nafisa's all too real characters lose themselves in ideas of themselves, dressing in costumes both literal and metaphorical until their imaginary problems become real ones. In Suicide Watch, a woman posts an ambiguous, vaguely suicidal poem on social media to get attention, only to die in an explosion when she accidentally microwaves her phone. This horrifying self-own speaks to the American moment like few others I have seen in fiction. Nafisa has a new story for us tonight, and it's my honor to turn the mic over to her. Nafisa. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction, um, John. And it's an honor to read with Valgina and to be introduced by you, and also to be welcomed into the Cornell community so warmly by so many people. Um, I appreciate Lynn and Aurora and Owen and Chris's work on this, and also the Zelazniks and the Cleveland Friends for their generosity in setting up this reading series and funding it. So I'm going to read new work. I'm a little bit tired of some of the colored people, if I'm being honest. Um, it's turning three on April 10th. So it, it's actually not so new anymore. And it just came out in Brazilian um, Portuguese yesterday. So I'm excited about that. And I'm going to be trying to film a video in Brazilian Portuguese later on um, so that I can welcome that new audience. Um, but today I'd like to read from a story that is forthcoming in Plowshares, um, an edited issue by Amy Bender, and it's kind of right up Amy Bender's alley. And it's after Elizabeth Gaskell's The Old Nurses Story. 
and this is called The Old Doctor Story, or The Haunting of Mill Creek Medical Facility. And I'll only read about halfway through, but I'm happy to talk about what else goes on. Dr. Burton was having a no good, very bad day, and I was more than a little proud of my role in it. I watched from the eaves of her beamed kitchen as she burned her coffee and then her tongue, cussing a little, and then as her boys, all five of them, fought her requests, demands, and eventual threats that they had better eat their cereal breakfasts or else, no TV that evening and no video games. The baby gummed a frozen teething ring without comfort and wailed as she lifted him from his high chair and bounced him between her shoulder and hip around the exquisite space. White glass-paned cabinets and a matching walk-in pantry, turquoise and royal blue hand-cut tile work on the black splash, stainless steel appliances, and a separate maid's kitchen in addition to the bar and island. Not my taste, mind you, but representative of a certain level of comfort she could only afford at the expense of people like me and her husband's job as a professor of mechanical engineering at the self-same university where I used to teach. Outside, the devil beat his wife all morning, the sun glistening through lush raindrops that ran down the street and threatened flash floods on local radio. And while I don't perform the devil's bidding, only my own, I delighted in his contribution of additional stressors as Dr. Burton made her way to her car parked in the driveway, despite her three-car garage. I turned her umbrella inside out just as she managed to spill her travel mug onto and partly into her Wellington boots. Her limp brown hair hung about her neck in soaked clumps and dripped onto her collar. She pinched the bridge of her nose before backing out into her commute to the hospital, stalled four times by detours where workers placed sandbags and hazard signs. It would be a glorious day for me to be sure, though I hadn't outlined my course of actions yet. Rather than a set plan, though there are consistencies, I like to respond to her as the day proceeds. This method, method seems to cause the most damage. For the first three months, beginning a year ago, I blasted Lionel Richie's Rhythm of the Night, but only the Swahili part at jagged intervals from non-existent speakers in her office at the OBGYN wing of the facility that shook the walls randomly throughout each of her work days. At first, the nurses lined up in the hallway outside their doors and did a bad impression of a flash mob in their soft orthopedic shoes, and Dr. Burton joined them, laughing a stifled laugh between a cough and a choke. The dancing persisted only twice but no one but Dr. Burton seemed especially disturbed by the music. She called in a hospital IT specialist who could find no source and shrugging as he left her office said, maybe it's a ghost. He winked, she snarled. Eventually I switched to something profane with more bass. The unedited version of Ja Rule's throwback classic, you understand, and found the nurses and phlebotomists bobbing their heads as they worked whispering that Dr. Burton couldn't possibly enjoy this kind of music. One white one even said nigga along with the rapper, so I made blood squirt onto her face as she removed an IV catheter from a patient's arm. She screamed, but she never sang along with the song again. Dr. Burton never bobs her head anymore, even in the car, and when she used to dance, it was on the one and the three. She just jumps now every time the music plays in her office or exam rooms, dropping speculums just before insertion, ruining specimen samples and requiring patients to make unhappy return visits for cultures in urine, yelling at her attending nurse, a pretty young woman whom Dr. Burton treats like a sixth toe or other unwanted appendage, who says, whatever is haunting this place has a sense of humor and good taste in music and spends her off-peak time looking at pictures of labradoodles on Instagram. Sometimes when she's alone in her office, Dr. Burton cries onto her desk and then wiping her eyes just before it's time to consult with a patient, pretends she's regained her composure. But I can feel the frazzling, her coming undone. And speaking of Jagged, I have taken recently to playing Alanis Morissette's Uninvited, especially during her night shifts and sometimes Weezer's The Sweater Song. Both are a bit on the nose, 
But since she'll never find a source and has no control, it matters little to me. Anyway, I no longer have a nose. What I do care about is her rating on physicians.com, which has descended from a 4.3 to a 2.7 in just six months, with many complaints from patients in the comments section. My favorite. Dr. Burton is the most insensitive, unprofessional doctor I have ever had. Her unironic and unfunny use of music during exams borders on sadistic, and her bedside manner leaves much to be desired. Plus, she misdiagnosed me with mere dysmenorrhea for a year. When I finally asked for a second opinion, the new doctor performed an exploratory laparoscopic surgery that found endometriosis had glued nearly all of my lower organs together. The fact that I have suffered for so long under her care without proper diagnosis just proves how uncaring and unknowledgeable she is. If I could give her negative stars, I would but a one star and warning, do not go, will have to suffice. This woman's story is not unlike my own, but in my case, Dr. Burton performed a botched surgery on me when I told her I suspected I suffered from endometriosis. She used outdated equipment, did not call in the bowel specialist she promised to employ if endo was found in my digestive organs, and left me with little motility for years until I too sought a specialist who corrected some, but not much, of her damage. I lived with repeated surgeries from there, each leaving a mass of tight scar tissue where a baby might have once grown, had my uterus and ovaries been reparable. But no, I lost six organs and a marriage to the combination of the persistent disease and depression. I've never written a bad review of her, lest she trace it back to me, no matter my online alias and lack of life. What I have done instead is what you witness now, posthumously making her suffer as much as she made me, though I don't think a woman with five sons, several of whom she was pregnant with during the years I was her patient, can ever understand my grief. I don't want to deal here with the details of my suicide, and though I won't say that my life is better post-death, it is certainly more fun. For the kind nurses and doctors and the patients with whom I feel an affinity, I sometimes leave little gifts behind. I sneak in at night to do this. It's not true that ghosts can't feel or take form, and I prefer the term sylph anyhow. I can lift champagne bottles from the local BevMo and often do, leaving them or mysterious fruit baskets on bedsides or desks. A cavity inside of me allows me to store these objects without them floating inexplicably through the air as films have misrepresented. The cavity between where my breasts and pelvic organs used to live is never too full, so I can carry many large baskets of fruit and nuts and flowers or bottles full of champagne with ease. If the security cameras in the stores catch anything, it's the brief lifting and disappearance of the objects into my unseen cavernous space. And I have my own sort of Hippocratic oath, do no harm except to Dr. Burton. I only ever steal from big box businesses that won't even miss the items, and I adjust inventory records to prevent the employees from getting in trouble. I deliver the best gifts to the neonatologist, who despite the high stakes and stress of their work, the fine, delicate needlepoint of their instruments, maintain a kindness and empathy for the babies and their families. Sometimes I comfort the babies in the ward with a gustatory kiss or a feeling of skin-to-skin -skin contact, which I create by generating heat. The neonatologists amaze me. Once Dr. Burton and her husband lamented over dinner that working as a professor of engineering and as a gynecologist, respectively, involved constant repetition, trying to solve the same problems over and over. Yep, this is chlamydia. This is a yeast infection. You're pregnant, Dr. Burton said bitterly into her butternut squash soup, while her husband told stories of comparable mathematical diagnoses. Yet the neonatologists perform the same kind of repetition, but always with reverence, generous spirits. Dr. Burton, it should go without saying, never receives gifts from me. For her, I have stolen a turd from a patient's stool sample and deposited it into her box of sterile gloves and once lured a family of raccoons into surrounding her in the parking lot. They opened their creepy raccoon hands as though they were coming to take her away, haha. -ha. 
She dropped her coffee all over her Crocs and burned her foot and white socks brown through the little holes in her shoes, alternately hopping and trying to run from the vicious creatures who moved in sync, leaning their heads and necks to the best choreography from Thriller, which I blasted from her car. Today, though, I rode along with her in the car, causing static on both her satellite and traditional radio stations, and making her fingers undetectable by the touchscreen on her dashboard. I took my time following her into the office. I had already visited the medical center earlier in the morning. I never sleep, and time has no meaning anymore. One big circle, a dark purgatory, to make sure that her colleague, Dr. Schaefer, parked his SUV at a 45-degree angle over the yellow line and into her reserved space so she'd have to drive several floors up to the parking garage to find an open space and park among the mere patients. Once she removed her wellies and changed her socks into ugly anti-slip hospital ones two sizes too big, she settled into her office with a fresh cup of chamomile and two Valiums, a foolish combination unless you want to fall asleep on the job. I waited. I've got nothing but patience and a handful of raucous spirits I sometimes confer with at night or when I'm bored. A few times we have collaborated to help me intensify the terror. I leave the grand ancestors alone, Sarge and Henrietta and every enslaved woman or child tortured by J. Marion Sims, the alleged founder of modern gynecology. They've been traumatized and re-traumatized and summoned too many times over and need their rest now. So I mostly rely on my peers, a little help from my friends, millennials and Gen Xers harmed more recently by botched surgeries, unsympathetic, and even, doc even cruel doctors who ignored their misdiagnosed symptoms or patently dismissed them until it was too late who carry in their new forms the right combination of fresh pain and restlessness and ire to persist through their exhaustions and seek revenge. I didn't need any additional help for my plan this afternoon. I let Dr. Burton treat two patients with ease, looking over her shoulder at intervals with high adrenaline coursing through her, a feral paranoia growing the longer she waited for signs of my presence. Like some of the blood seekers, vampires in common vernacular I have met when they are hungry but whose company I do not keep. I played no music. I let her mind create for her hell for several hours. Then just as her sedatives fully took over and she sank with a great plop and hiss into her leather chair for a break, I pounced. First I made the chair spin her wildly around in whirling circles, a teacup ride to match her chamomile, which she held and spilled. Once she looked a little peaked and green, I began what I've enjoyed a few other times. I created a sort of secular stigmata, causing her to bleed inexplicably from her armpits and nose. She lucked out. My mood was good enough that I didn't perform the worst of it, as I have done on other occasions, flooding her underwear with a heavy off-cycle flow so intense it leaks through her scrubs and white coat in the middle of her examinations. Sometimes I have shaped the blood into Rorschach clots, a long snake like the one she dismissed when I brought it to her attention while under her care, or a baby with a grimace, a fetus at four months of development with a face like her oldest son. The latter clots floor her, so large are they to pass, and she has taken to wearing supersized pads, the kind they give women after childbirth, every day, just in case, and popping a Valium or two, 10 milligrams each, into her mouth before driving. There are few things so uncomfortable as the equivalent of an adult diaper and the fear that blood may squirt, gush, or seep from any orifice at any time. This has effectively killed her sex life with Professor Burton, and after a negative MRI, she has diagnosed her symptoms as related to aggressive perimenopause, giving me the idea to add night sweats and day sweats hot flashes, weight gain, and additional mood swings. She makes it almost too easy for me. I retain my ethics though. I never cause bleeding or play the music while she's actively delivering a baby, only during exams, because even though I never got to experience motherhood myself, I empathize with the pregnant women and all of her patients, whom I've noted she treats with a broad, inconsistent, but often dismissive attitude. 
What have I done to deserve this? She cried into her empty mug after the chair stopped spinning. What have I done? I answered her question with a blast of music. Stars is your ex-lover is dead, playing the intro on a loop, and then the line, repent of your sins, like a record stuck under the needle. Dr. Burton is not a religious woman, but she dropped to her knees and repeated, what have I done? Just as her nurse knocked once and came into the office to tell her her 430 patient was prepped and waiting in exam room four. Dr. Burton stood up abruptly and the nurse screamed, your armpits, there's blood everywhere. Were you? She hesitated. Praying when that happened? Dr. Burton said, Juliana, please bring me a clean set of scrubs from my locker and a new white coat quickly. But Dr. Burton, Juliana, now, please, she shouted with so much bass that the raven-haired girl fled the room, whispering to the other nurses on her way to retrieving the clothes. I left then to take my own break. It requires a lot of emotional energy to conjure up new ideas. I do not lack empathy, but the hole where I sometimes store champagne or gift baskets feels empty without anger to fill it. I'd been emptied of so much before my death that I've lived and not lived with many holes for years now. I'm not sure how to satiate my own needs other than via this vengeance. I'm sure there's no place for me in heaven or hell now. I once cut the line at purgatory and saw that it involved staying still and worrying like being crammed into a Manhattan elevator at a Holiday Inn with 20 floors. I peeked at hell too, weeping and gnashing of teeth as real as the good book warns. So I invented my own purgatory, running free, even if it means roaming for the rest of my days. There are some spirits who spend their time transforming into butterflies or birds or little fairy lights to remind their loved ones that they care and still watch over them. I can't see such work in my future. I can only focus on Dr. Burton. I met her again hours later at her home. I know the way well because she lives just 10 houses down the street from where I used to live always witnessing her walking with her ever-expanding brood and belly past my house while I sat inside it, drugged up in pain on nearly every paltry medication they will give a black woman, and that is to say, very few. I used to think I was just being paranoid despite reputable research to the contrary, but now I have seen firsthand the white and wealthy Asian women with morphine drips and epidurals and buttons they can push to dispense a shot of this or that at their every whim or whence. And I've seen too the poor Asian and indigenous and Latinx women, the non-binary people and the black women in the recovery room right after the same kind of surgeries I've suffered through many times, sent home the same day with prescription Tylenol 3 which might as well be Skittles for all the good it does. We are taught not to complain. We are told our symptoms are in our heads post-surgery, that the disease can't have grown back, that they wouldn't have missed any, that we are suffering from phantom spasms and the pathologies of our minds. We are told to return to work within a week. White women are told they'll need six to eight weeks to recover, sometimes even longer than that. They are sent home with Percocet, hydromorphine, given fentanyl if necessary. When I worked at the same university as Professor Burton currently does, I limped into my classroom two days after surgery, belly binder barely hidden under a tent dress, bandages still covering all my incisions, my navel padded with gauze and tape, and I taught two classes. For the first four weeks after my surgery, weak and still in severe pain, I couldn't understand why it was taking me so long to heal until a kind physician, a friend of my former husband, explained that I needed months, not days, and that I should have been given anti-nausea medication to prevent the violent swells of vomiting that disrupted my tender organs, intestines, especially the nights after surgery. I was right all along, and I might still have bodily form, a full life, if I were white all along. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nafisa. I don't know if the two of you consulted each other before the reading, but it's extraordinary to me how much overlap there is thematically between these two very different, tonally different uh, readings. 
Um, the audience has some questions for the two of you, and I'll get to them in a moment. I just first want to tell the audience to please, uh, if you want to buy books from our speakers, we have a couple of links for you that our producer, Chris, is putting in the chat. One is Buffalo Street Books here in Ithaca, New York. The other is Mahogany Books in Washington, D.C. And if you want signed copies of these books, uh, we all live in Ithaca, and though it might take a little while, um, we will, uh, the writers will be able to wander over to Buffalo Street and sign books for you to be shipped to you. Um, so please put a note uh, when you put in your order if you'd like the books to be signed. Um, okay. The first question, uh, we have questions for both writers here. Uh, the first one, though, is for Valgina, and this is from Michael. Valgina, hey, Michael. <laughs> says, Algina, I'm curious of the writing and editing process for the poem's arrangement, how you conceived of its sections slash movements, and what troubles and discoveries you might have had along the way. And I should add that some of the poem is actually in pro some of the sections are in prose for those people who couldn't see the, who might not have been able to see the, uh, the screen. Um, do you want to answer that? Oh yeah, of course. Thank you for that question. Um, I mean, it's the, the question of form is um, the question of definition of poetry. How does one arrange lines? How does one arrange sections? Um, that's the question uh, that is asking, how do you write? <laughs> how do you write a poem? Because writing a poem is about arrangement. Um, and uh, for me, uh, poetic form is um, a, a musical form um, in that um, I listen to um, a lot of Baroque music, liturgy, and also classical music. And um, I really enjoy the patterns of repetition. I enjoy um, the way that a theme uh, plays first and then there are variations on it, uh, variations on the theme. So all of these structural, structural things I take uh, from music and music as a subject goes through the book. Uh, one could also think about it very architecturally, or one of my favorite books on um, uh, poetry, which is not on poetry at all, is a book about gardens and how gardens are laid out um, uh, and arranged. And uh, there is a sentence in that book that, sends that, uh, that says something like, um, uh, to arrange a garden is to diversify a garden, which means that in a field or in a forest, you kind of just walk through uh, the same landscape and you see everything that is in front of you. But a garden is all about taking turns. And uh, after every turn or uh, a passage where your view is blocked by trees and then what is behind them is revealed is a surprise. And a poem is very much like that too. It's a little bit of a musical piece. Um, and um, also it's a garden, it's a physical architectural space that has been thought through for the reader to walk through and, um, and be surprised at its every turn by uh, how it slows down and picks up, by how it goes loud and goes uh, very quiet, um, but otherwise, um, it's very intuitive. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the next question is for Nafisa, uh, and this is from Jetta Mayberry, and the, the, uh, the information that's, that's useful to know before I ask this is that uh, in addition to her short fiction, Nafisa has recently published a number of really moving essays. Um, and this question is about essays and fiction. Um, Jetta says, can you comment on your process for deciding when to approach a topic in essay versus the short story form? Have you contemplated writing a memoir or essay collection? Oh, you're, you're muted. Thank you for that question, Jetta. Um, yes, I have thought about writing a memoir. I'll start there and I am working on one currently. Um, but I'm finding that it's easier for me to write an essay. Um, I am by training a literary scholar first, and I did my MFA after doing a PhD in English. And so I think like a critic, and 
the essay just comes more naturally to me often than fiction does. Um, most of my collection and essays have a lot of overlap between them in terms of the themes that I tend to write about. I write a lot about the black body. I write a lot about um, vulnerability and the way that there's a sort of medical apartheid system in this country and everywhere else, especially for women and especially for women of color. And I've written a number of essays that have dealt with my own struggle with writing with a chronic illness. I have endometriosis. And so this story in particular, I felt made a lot more sense in essay, I mean, in fiction form than in an essay form, because it allowed me to imagine a kind of revenge that I'll never be able to have. I did have a, a horrible gynecologist who performed the first surgery on me. So it's an autobiographical story. I'm not a ghost, obviously. I'm still here. But I wish I could have done these things to her. If I could make blood squirt in her face or scare her with her face, the faces of her children in her underwear, I, I would do all of that. Um, but I've never written a bad review of her because there's something in me that fears a, a kind of karmic, I guess, um, payback for doing that kind of thing, even though she is a terrible doctor. And so this story was a way of getting some of that energy and that anger, which I finally have started to come to terms with, out. Um, and in terms of the essay, I often approach essays when there's something inside me that's just nagging to come out. And it's usually something with which I'm still reckoning, like anger, but most more likely depression. I think I write fiction out of anger and I write essays out of depression. And they're both um, kind of terrible motivations, but that's just the, the truth of it for me. Great, thank you. I, I, I feel like whatever gets you to the page uh, is fine. <laughs> Um, our next question uh, is from Allison Rollins, and conveniently, it is for both of you. Um, but let's start with uh, Valgina, and then Nafisa can respond to it. The question is this. In a reading on Monday, Valgina commented, when I'm in control, I have very little to offer. I'm curious for both readers what it means for them to be in control versus out of control when writing. Oh, that Monday reading. <laughs> I lost control, obviously. <laughs> um, well, um, that question was, and the question of control for me is the question of lyrical voice. Um, and I've also written some essays, and that's a very different process. The process of, uh, right, of translating is also quite different. Um, I'm a poet who writes in two languages at once. Neither of them is my mother tongue. So, or at least in um, that kind of most um, direct way, mother tongue. So I write in two acquired languages. And the act of writing for me is never... Um, uh, kind of unconscious and uh, of overflowing like uh, an Ithaca waterfall. I'm not somebody who, you know, sits in the backyard and watches the lights outside and takes a sip of wine and then start, starts speaking in poetry. Um, for me, uh, beginning a poem is always a very conscious process that in many ways is violent. I think that writing poetry is violence that is done to language, is violence that is done to mind, to, well, to normal speech, to daily speech, and to um, daily logic. And so um, uh, once it's so it is a very uh, controlled process in the beginning always or rather very conscious right um so i'm somebody who dissects <laughs> the body of language carefully in white gloves and then um starts moving moving language around in uncomfortable ways looking for the biggest degree of tension uh, that is possible, which is uh, could be compared to physical uncomfort, right? 
to physical pain. Um, you know, when um, when I was a child, we used to do this to each other when you twist your arm into separate ways. We call it doing nettle to each other because nettle burns as a plant. Um, and so that's kind of, and we love doing that to each other, children, and it hurt, and, but we also want it to be done to us. And um, I think that it's very, kind of a very similar to what a poet does to language. It poet twists the language this way, performing violence on, on it. But at some point in this process of very painstakingly and consciously thinking about words and structures in two languages that are not mine, um, um, I have to, um, I have to lose what my mind is capable of. And uh, I have to go uh, and be surprised, right? Um, that's, um, if there is no surprise in the process of writing, in the process of do, engaging in any art, not just poetry, um, if one does not arrive to that spot where you have never planned to arrive and arriving there disturbs you and mystifies you and um, uh, so uh, uh, the, and is a moment of illumination or to arrive to that moment of that epiphany uh, which is not really an epiphany for a poem um, I have to follow language rather than what I want to say, what I have to say. I'm a poet, a poet full of obsessions. I'm a poet full of things uh, that I accumulated and are always rotating around me um, uh, in some kind of gravitational pool. Never, you know, I just want to do that, but it does not go away. Yeah, but, um, but I have to go beyond that and listen to what language has to offer because language is full of its own um, violence, but also its own history, which is also my history, um, even in a foreign language. In fact, a foreign language is perhaps for people who come from uh, violence is a bit of a mask, a bit of a distance. Uh, but still, I have to learn to lose myself in it. The last metaphor here I'll use is getting lost in a city, yeah? You get lost in a city, that's how you get to know it. You get lost in a poem, that's how you get to know the poem you're writing. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have time for just one more answer, and that will be uh, Nafisa's answer to the same question. Again, it's um, uh, the question was, uh, what it means for you to be in control versus out of control when you're writing. Would you answer that? I love everything Valjina said, and it makes me wish I were a poet. Um, a lot of things come to me through the same sort of rustling with language, but also there's something a person in my MFA program said, and I didn't, I couldn't stand this person, but she said one useful thing ever out of three years, and it was that you know that you have a story when you're in bed like this, kind of wrestling with it, and it's it's beating you, and there is a violence in that, and it happens to me most of the time. I may have a sort of elevator pitch for a story. I want to write a ghost story about um, a haunted doctor who had done wrong by this patient. And I have to let that unfold and unfurl on its own. And the story sort of takes on its own will. And I can control the language. I keep a list of words. I've been doing this for decades that I would like to use eventually. And I, I'm always, as I'm reading, taking notes, beautiful word, going in that list. But I can control that, but I can't necessarily control the characterization that comes to me or the structure that comes to me. I can give it a form afterwards, but I do a lot of my best writing, honestly, at three o'clock in the morning when I'm in bed trying to sleep and my, my mind is saying, no, write this down, write this down, write this down. And I dictate into my phone in the notes app all night long, pretty much every night. And that's how most of my stories start to take form. It's because they are haunting me, because they are forcing me into it. And 
it's kind of a fun process. It's just like doing this used to be. Um, we went through a phase at my school where we were literally erasing our skin with erasers and everybody got horrible rug burns and big welts on our skin. And it was terrible, but we still kept doing it. And then we started choking each other. And it, there was no like eroticism involved in it. There was just like a weird attachment to violence. And I think that storytelling and poetry kind of unfold in the same way. Just a quick follow-up. Do, do the notes that you dictate in the middle of the night make sense when you see them on your phone in the morning? Depends on how medicated I am um, <laughs> based on my pain. But yeah, there's usually something there. Siri and I are always in a constant battle for her to get the word right. So <laughs> I might say mockish and she'll write Marcus and I'm infuriated the next day when I see that. But um, usually there's something I can work with. Well, as Siri would say, duck and A. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, thank you. That's all we have time for. Uh, I'm grateful to Valgina and Nafisa for those wonderful readings and the family and friends of Richard Cleveland, uh, Barbara and David Zelaznik, E. Cornell for producing this uh, cast, and everyone who attended for attending. The next Zelaznik Reading Series event will be a talk from Rita P. Davis on Thursday, March 11th at 7 p.m. And please follow Cornell English on Twitter um, and check our website for a listing of events and to be kept in touch about those things. We hope we see you all again. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you.